I'm going to talk, I'm going to try and focus this talk on um, the question at hand in terms of Victoria's native forests, but my work um, is generally more broadly focused on um, international climate policy and um, the role of forests and land in mitigation and the, intera the interaction between those two in terms of how um, climate policy and carbon accounting rules, what sort of outcomes they drive in the land sector. So we heard yesterday the, um, the link, the inherent link between climate change and biodiversity. And this is often, in this kind of context or with this sort of audience, this might seem very ob obvious, but in the um, climate negotiations or when you're immersed in climate policy, you have to keep hammering this home that um, climate change drives biodiversity loss, increasing um, warming, increasing temperatures, increased extreme weather events, but also biodiversity loss contributes to climate change, obviously, through um, increased carbon in the atmosphere if we lose forests and other ecosystems. But I want to drill down a level below that and talk about the inherent links between carbon stocks in the forest um, and climate policy. Um, so that's... What, what I've set up here, um, biodiversity confer confers resilience on land and forest carbon stocks. So carbon is actually the building block of all life. And this is often forgotten in, in thinking about this link between carbon and biodiversity. And what that means is a diverse, a more diverse ecosystem, so higher levels of biodiversity, will confer resilience on that carbon because uh, more diverse ecosystems are more resilient to external stresses and shocks and therefore the carbon that is um, in that diversity will also be more stable and resilient. And this has big implications for climate policy and the way we account for and incentivize carbon because climate policy is focused on carbon, not biodiversity. And you would think if carbon is a building block of life and of biodiversity, then focusing on incentivizing carbon will, uh, as a flow on, have good biodiversity results. It's actually the opposite. Um, focusing on carbon can have negative biodiversity results, and I'll step you through that, whereas focusing on biodiversity, on ecosystem integrity more broadly, um, on what's being called nature-based solutions, if done well, will always have good carbon results. So. My argument here and the title of the presentation was um, enhancing carbon values in forests. The very simple answer to that is to focus on biodiversity and ecosystem integrity. And if that's all you remember from this presentation, that is the main message. <laughs> um, so ecosystem integrity, what is that? The resilience, the resilience and permanence of carbon stocks depends on our ability to maintain naturally biodiverse, healthy and resilient ecosystems. And we had a lot of talk yesterday going through um, healthy, what was a healthy um, forest, the different um, values of that. But carbon accounting rules focus on carbon fluxes, and this is where the problem is. Um, it's actually the quality of carbon stocks that's critical to ecosystem integrity and not the flux. So if, if you're in the world of carbon accounting, we talk about fluxes versus stocks, fluxes out of an ecosystem when we lose carbon or lose forest and into when a forest sequesters carbon. It's the same um, in terms of fossil fuel emissions. We have a flux of emissions to the atmosphere. We don't have any sequestration in any sector other than the land sector. So they're only one way in all other sectors, but it's two, the flux is a two way in the land sector. Um, but that, that flux is not, that does not tell us anything about the quality of the carbon stocks in the ecosystem. And so that's what's critical to critical to ecosystem integrity and therefore to the resilience of those carbon stocks. And so the diagram here, I think, um, applies quite well to um, what Rob was ta Rod was talking about yesterday in terms of the different kinds of forests and the different types of forest estate we have across Victoria. Um, we could think of the low ecosystem integrity picture as our plantation estate. And so it is, um, it's human modified, there's little biodiversity and ecosystem function. Uh, it's therefore more vulnerable to um, external stresses, low levels of biodiversity. Um, also low levels of carbon stocks, but that's not what's measured. What's measured is the flux if you first planted it. So we get a perverse, anyway, I'll go through that in a minute. Um, moderate ecosystem integrity could be um, increasing the diversity or of a plantation estate, or it could be what we're talking about <clears throat> um, here with the degraded and logged forests. Uh, their, their ecosystem, um, their diversity, their integrity is reduced as are their carbon stocks. 
And then we have high ecosystem integrity, and that could be our primary intact forests, uh, of which we have vanishingly small, but we could consider that our protected forests in national parks. So if we actually monitored at this level and focused on um, trying to incentivize increased ecosystem integrity, then um, we would get carbon co-benefits out of that. Uh, one thing that's missing out of this sort of schema, I mean, sorry, many, many things missing out of this schema, but uh, something I often focus on a lot that I left out of this presentation is regenerative agriculture. And I think Rod yesterday mentioned Rowan Reed as well, who's been a real leader in pushing, in um, gaining further understanding of the concept of trees on farms and um, what's called agroforestry, um, in, including forests and increasing woody biomass in um, agricultural and productive systems. And so that would sort of fall in the moderate ecosystem integrity category. And it's, it's a, a potentially a better way of producing um, <clears throat> timber harvest, for example, than a monoculture plantation. Um, I also, and I'll, I'll come back to that ecosystem integrity and that monitoring framework. So I also wanted to talk about another value, another contribution of forests to um, climate regulation that has also been undervalued. And that's this concept of cool forests. So forests, um, uh, the climate benefits of forests go beyond just the, beyond the carbon sequestration and the carbon stores in the forest. They also regulate the climate from global to local scales through um, things like surface albedo, evapotranspiration, surface roughness causing wind currents, and um, aerosols scattering <coughs> can be um, scattering light and um, affecting rainfall patterns. So there's a new uh, report on this from WRI. If there's something you're interested in, this was a really an effort to bring together the research in this field and make it relevant to climate policy. And it's quite a groundbreaking report that's also worth looking at. Um, so beyond carbon is what we're trying to think about here. <clears throat> what are the barriers to effective um, forest climate policy have been Really, first and foremost, the myths and misinformation about carbon storage and sequestration in forests. So that idea that we focus on carbon fluxes, we try to incentivize carbon fluxes over um, preserving carbon stocks has been a real problem. Um, there's been a, a big wood production bias uh, in, in rules and definitions. So from the FAO coming into the IPCC, we have a lot of the rules and definitions of forests that are really um, based on wood production goals <clears throat> rather than biodiversity goals or even carbon goals. Um, inappropriate accounting rules for natural ecosystems, and I'll go through a solution there. Um, insufficient funding and appropriate investment criteria, and some of these monitoring and accounting approaches cross over a lot with um, what was just spoken about. Um, and fail to recognize, failure to recognize the rights of indigenous peoples and support local communities. So these are some of the barriers. I am just going to step you through a little bit more the perverse um, incentives or outcomes we get from carbon accounting rules that are focused on carbon fluxes. And people have probably seen this. This is used a lot. Like I see this as a sort of conservation hierarchy, the idea of protect, restore, and then sustainably manage. Or here we said protect, restore, and replant. This is also being picked up in the climate mitigation community and sort of the natural-based solution space to say to in uh, to emphasize the point that there is a hierarchy in when we're thinking about the role of land and forest in climate mitigation and that the the biggest contribution forests can make to climate mitigation is in is in terms of primary forests and the value of the carbon stocks and biodiversity in those intact standing forests so the first priority is always to protect forests the second priority is to restore degraded forests, and so we have a huge opportunity now in Victoria with, um, um, with a chance to restore forests that had previously been logged forests. And the third or lower priority would be to replant, and replanting has to be done well. If, if you follow the news or the sort of hype around nature-based solution and trees and climate change, there has been quite a bit of headlines around tree planting will save the planet, a trillion trees. I think even Trump was um, touting the value of a trillion trees, if you need any more evidence that it's probably a flawed idea. Um, <laughs> So we really need to shift from this idea of tree planting as a, uh, as a good climate solution to protecting forests and restoring forests. And this is a little bit while the, why the carbon accounting rules have um, 
incentivise tree planting. So forest management priorities, so I'm just going through that protect, restore, replant or manage hierarchy. So in terms of protecting existing forests, um, primary forests store more carbon, significantly more carbon than degraded forests. Uh, the importance of primary forests for climate um, regulation is probably what I meant to say there in terms of that cool forests, um, those other benefits forests provide. And um, we have indigenous stewards stewardship over 36% of the world's remaining intact ecosystems. Um, I'll show you the map of that later. So there's a, a confluence between indigenous stewardship and knowledge and ecosystems that remain intact and in value. But in terms of carbon accounting implication, carbon accounting focuses on fluxes, and so there is nothing in carbon accounting rules that would value a primary forest. Because, and, and people may know that um, intact, older, um, mature forests do continue to sequester carbon, but that's part of the background natural carbon cycle, so we can't count that as, um, as a climate goal. So um, there's no counting of carbon stocks, it's only fluxes. So we don't value primary forests. And there has been a lot of, um, uh, uh, there was a lot of work done, if you've heard of RED, reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation at the UNFCCC, a lot of work done to put in safeguards to say that you can't convert a primary forest to a plantation and then count the carbon sequestration of that as a climate benefit, which, um, which should, be, should be very obvious but this is where um, these kinds of counting rules take us. So another problem that is coming now from um, carbon accounting rules is avoided, there, there used to be sort of a provision of avoided deforestation. So I was going to cut this forest down, now I'm not. This much carbon didn't get emitted to the atmosphere, so you get carbon credits for that, which is fundamentally problematic because it's a hypothetical, you can't prove it, and so you get a lot of hot air. We had this, um, and this has happened in Australia as well as globally, where there's been a lot of criticism of this method. It's resulted in avoided deforestation being excluded from most carbon markets. Um, the review of the ACU scheme in Australia, one of the main recommendations was to exclude um, avoided deforestation methodology. It's also happened internationally. But what that means, because at the moment we don't have a lot of alternative um, financial incentives and income streams for forest protection, so what's known as HFLD countries, high forest, low deforestation countries, are now cut out of that income stream from carbon markets. So we need alternatives here. We don't need carbon credits with no climate integrity, but we need alternative ways to value um, intact primary forests and to support countries who have large areas of that to protect them. So the second one is restoring um, degraded ecosystems. A lot more potential here for um, <coughs> carbon um, uh, incentives to, to, to marry with financial incentives. So um, ecosystems regenerate when disturbance is removed. That's kind of simplistic. We heard a lot yesterday about the difficulty of eradicating um, invasive species and feral animals and, and the regeneration failing in a lot of places. But removing um, a major human disturbance like logging is a first good step. And then there's a lot more work to do. Um, and also, effectively, what I'm talking about here is ecological principles of, of restoration around buffering um, primary forests, connecting secondary forests, etc. This will all result in better outcomes. Um, in terms of carbon incentives, what matters here is uh, focusing on the quality of carbon stocks so that that um, restoration or improvement in that ecosystem condition can be monitored over time. And um, there's new monitoring frameworks that uh, can focus on this, and I'll, I'll go through that a little bit at the end. But the idea is that it's not the um, carbon in that ecosystem we want to track, but the extent of the ecosystem, the condition of it, and therefore the, that will translate to the quality of carbon stocks. And so I've listed there the uh, UN System of in Economic and Environmental Accounting has um, a new methodology called Ecosystem Approaches, and I saw a lot of overlaps between this and, and what you were just talking about, Jim, um, as well as the EU Nature Restoration Law is, is another example of taking this kind of approach. Okay, so that all went very quickly. And then the third one is um, manage, replant or manage. Um, and probably something I want to say here is what has struck me that I feel like now I'm listening out for it, but yesterday I started to notice that in every single presentation, people have talked about the importance of context-based and place-based. 
And I think that is, that's a very resounding message that comes out. So this is all very context specific, very site specific. And if it is, then it stands to reason or it goes without saying that it's local communities in those places and indigenous peoples and the holders of traditional knowledge who really need to be involved in the decision making around how to govern and help um, restore places. So um, community, community um, based and community governed um, forestry schemes and replanting have always had more success than sort of some external thing that might um, displace community needs obviously is going to be a problem. The issue here in terms of carbon accounting and carbon markets is high barriers to entry for community um, and local um, indigenous peoples or community um, initiatives. Uh, and I can go into that more, but that's sort of a, that's an issue in terms of the, the cost of MRV, the cost of establishing a project is prohibitive. So I've got, um, I just want to finish up on probably two more slides. So this is what I was talking about before, the UN system of environmental economic accounting, a new um, approach here called ecosystem approaches. And this was really pioneered, or a lot of the work for this was done by Heather Keith, who um, David also mentioned in some of his presentation yesterday. So I really recommend this paper from Heather. And it struck me that this um, model here kind of crosses over with both of the previous presentations. So first we have, um, the economy is inside, is part of society and all of this is inside the environment, within the environment. So that's what frames all of our thinking and interactions um, around how we can value um, the different services of, of ecosystems. And then there's, there's a lot of detail and a lot of aspects of this, but what is useful for me in my work and what I use the most is this idea of focusing on ecosystem extent, condition, and then carbon accounting, comprehensive carbon accounting, it's called, in terms of stocks and fluxes. Um, in this paper, as well as in um, the previous image I showed you from Heather Keith, is in um, chapter three of something called the Langat Report, and I really recommend people look at that if you're interested in this, because she focuses on the central highlands of Victoria as a case study to apply this ecosystem accounting approach. Uh, and it's really sort of looking at the trade-offs and the values of the different ecosystem services. So a trade-off, obviously, there's losses in uh, ending harvest in native forests in terms of loss of wood supply, but there's benefits in terms of biodiversity, um, tourism values, et cetera. And she does a case study showing that the, uh, economic, ben the economic outcome there is um, in favour of, of what the Victorian government has chosen to do in terms of ending logging of native forests. So I've just put in four or five slides here that I don't, I knew I wouldn't have time to look at. So one other thing I wanted to point out, this is some work that I've done over the past um, couple of years. Uh, and again, it depends sort of where your lens is or where your perspective is in terms of climate change. But from where I sit there, as I said, there's a lot of hype around tree planting and nature-based solutions are going to save the planet. There's a misleading um, paper and statistic that gets quoted a lot that tells us that 30% of the climate um, challenge can be solved through nature-based solutions. It's definitely not that high. Um, so this is a paper we did where we looked at ecosystem restoration. We quantified on a global scale the carbon sequestration potential of that, and then we modeled it alongside um, um, steep emission reduction pathways that actually went to 100% renewables and almost zero emissions by 2050. Um, so the most deep emissions mitigation scenarios we have, and we found that by 2050, the ecosystem restoration, so the baseline with no ecosystem restoration is the dotted line, and then with the ecosystem restoration, we had 0 0.01 of a degree. Um, no, 0 0.001 of a degree by 2050, and only 0.01, only a tenth of a degree by uh, 2100 in terms of temperature reduction. So this is often looked at in terms of the mitigate the carbon sequestration, how much CO2 comes out of the atmosphere, rarely modelled in terms of the actual temperature impact. And, and so the message is that uh, it's actually reducing emissions, which mostly are from fossil fuels, but also from deforestation. That will um, help us limit warming to 1.5 or 2 degrees. So we really need to not let um, uh, forest conservation and restoration displace uh, displace uh, fossil fuel reduction, and that's what happens when we have a carbon accounting framework and allow offsetting between the two. Okay, so I will have to skip over this global map of lands managed by Indigenous peoples. We heard a lot yesterday on the importance of this from, um, from people who, who know this in a context-specific 
situation, but just um, good to see that there's a lot of research out there. I really point you to this paper, which shows us that, which tells us that 40% of intact ecosystems are, are managed by indigenous peoples. Also, huge amounts of carbon storage in indigenous lands. And um, I'll have to just let you read through the conclusions when the when the um, slides are circulated. But I, I hope my message is clear that if we want to promote carbon values in forests, it's all about biodiversity. <laughs>